nature only begotten Son, who by his life and parables taught us of your fatherly love. Make us worthy to celebrate today your great mercy as revealed in the parable of the prodigal son who repented and returned to his father. Like him, bring us back from the exile of sin to your fatherly house, so that we may glorify you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the Church and your children.
our incense and the forgiveness for the forgiveness of our sins. May those who have strayed from your fatherly house return there, that they may ask for pardon and forgiveness. And as for us, your weak children, strengthen our resolve to remain with you and to glorify you forever.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Praise be to God always. said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. And so the father divided the property between them. And after a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings, and he set off to a distant country, where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. And when he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. And so he hired himself out to one of the local citizens, who sent him out to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to fill, to eat his fill from the pods on which the swine fed but nobody gave him anything. And finally, coming to his senses, he thought within himself, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat, and here I am, dying from hunger. I shall get up, and I shall go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. And so he arose, and he went back to his father. And while he was yet a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. And he ran out to his son, he embraced him, and he kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, quickly, bring the finest robe and place it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And take the fattened calf and slaughter it. And then let us celebrate with a feast because this son of mine, who had been dead, has now come to life again. 
He was lost, but has been found. And then the celebrations began. Now the older son, who had been out in the field, was on his way back, and as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. And he called one of the servants, and he asked what this might mean. And the servant said to him, Your brother has returned, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him now back safe and sound. But he became angry, and he refused to enter the house. And so his father came out, and he pleaded with him. But he said to his father in reply, Look, all these years I have served you, and not once have I disobeyed your orders. And yet you never gave me even so much as a young goat to feast upon with my friends. But when this son of yours returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughtered the fattened calf. But he said to him, My son, you are here and with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice, because this your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and now has been found. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. in the 500s, he writes in the 6th century, and is extremely famous both in the Eastern and the Western churches. He's known as Dionysius the Areopagite. Now, I say he's known as Dionysius the Areopagite because, in fact, we have no idea who this man was. But from textual criticism, looking at the text, the historical records, these things, the text seems to have been written in the 500s out of Syria, but he's claiming a title of being the St. Dennis who converted under St. Paul in Athens, so centuries before. So I say, some people will call him the Pseudo-Dionysius. It doesn't matter. He's known as Dionysius the Areopagite and has an influence enormously upon the Eastern churches and upon the West. Much of the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas is influenced by this writer, the Syrian writer. And I bring him up because he brings a very beautiful vision of what is creation and redemption. And in fact, in many ways, the entire Summa of St. Thomas in the West actually reflects this vision. That the Eternal One, God of infinite goodness, God who is infinite love, God who is infinite charity, that He chooses freely on His own to create so that beings may participate in His goodness and share the eternal happiness that is His. And so Dionysius the Areopagite talks about the exodus, the movement from God as the act of creation, and then creatures return to God. So the entire Summa of St. Thomas, all 10,000 articles that are there, they're all about creation, the nature of man, virtue, sin, the redemption, and the return to God the entire enormous corpus of the writings of St. Thomas. And there are several writings of Dionysius 
and the, what he calls the ecclesiastical hierarchies, the angelic hierarchies, of this radiance of light that, ra that comes forth from God, enriches creation, makes creation, enriches it, and then of the free beings, the intelligent beings, the angels and human beings, that they have the ability to correspond with that reality of light and of charity and return to him, and to find definitively in his presence the reason why they're created. This is another way to understand, to try to break down and chisel away something of the kind of modern, relatively paganized vision of heaven, of some place we go if you've been a good boy or a good girl and you get to see the puppy you had when you were five. That's what the pagans, you just continue after life. Now, of course, in art, we show fields with flowers and people dancing and all these nice things because they're trying to show joy and happiness. But it doesn't mean you have to like dance a rondel like in Fra Angelico for all eternity, holding hands with the other saints, doing the same thing nonstop. That's not it. It's all about presence. The Eternal One chooses in His infinite, He who is, chooses to give other beings the possibility to be, and then to the intelligent beings to correspond in knowledge and in love. Hopefully, if you noticed in all of our prayers for these last three weeks, and now in this fourth week, the continual request of the prayers of Lent are soften our hearts, show us mercy, so that we can know you better and love you better. That's our purpose. And then that response of reciprocity of friendship that we always talk about, redemption is about presence. And we return to the infinite goodness and infinite charity that is God. And returning in that presence, we find the fulfillment for what we were created. Whether or not you're dancing in fields of flowers, according to Fra Angelica, which are exquisitely beautiful pictures. In fact, I have it hanging upstairs in the rectory, which is why I think of it. But it is important to understand that they are portraying things. But what the, all the reality is about is to come from God and to return to God. This is the perfection. And we bring this up because St. Paul has this very mysterious phrase in which he says we can do nothing against truth, but only for the truth in today's epistle. So today's epistle is chapter 13 of the second letter to the Corinthians. So it's the very end of his letter. It's the very end of the letter, and it's the very end of what he writes to the Corinthians, because it's the second letter, and there are only two, or two that we have records of. But apparently there's at least a third one that we just don't have. And in this letter, he winds up saying, this idea of test yourselves. Do you not know that Christ is at work within you? Because remember, we've talked about, in Corinth, he has a whole group of people in the parish who are just like always after him. This is wrong, that's wrong, he doesn't speak well, he's pretty wimpy when he's among us, and he writes these really tough letters. So there's all kinds of criticism, and he comes back to that again, and he says, look, it's a bit complicated when you read it, but what he's basically saying is, look, test yourselves that Christ is at work within you to realize that what is going on is God's grace. It's not about me, Paul. It's about Christ. So test yourself. Prove yourselves. Show whether or not Christ is working within you. You know, it's a bit like when you teach. You can always have one of those middle school kids or high school kids who sits in the back corner and who's going to make notes and pass them around or in recess or after school is going to say all kinds of obnoxious things about the teacher. You know, I kind of spread it around, the bad spirit. Because in a way, that kid, who often are very intelligent kids, but who are refusing to actually learn. So they're using their intelligence for a totally perverse purpose, which is to cause bad spirit and rebellion within the classroom. But what they're doing by attacking the teacher is actually giving themselves an excuse of why I don't have to follow this class, why I don't have to learn. He studies too much. She writes sloppily on the board. I can't read what she writes on the whiteboard. I can't see these things. All these excuses. That's what St. Paul is doing here at the end of the second letter. He's saying, look, test yourselves. Is Christ at work within you? My prayer is that you arrive at the perfection of accomplishing what is good. And he says, it doesn't really matter what I look like. He says, I would be happy if Christ is working within you. And he says, unless you fail the test 
and then you're reprobate, meaning you're cast off. That aspect behind it, he winds up saying that it doesn't matter then that for me to look like the bad teacher, I don't really care. The main purpose is, is that Christ works within you and develops and works this sanctification and this holiness, even if I look bad. But then he says in the letter, you'll see, he says, but I hope that I have not proven unfaithful, that I have not been a reprobate myself, that I have not been cast off. So that's what he's saying. And then he says in this phrase that we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. So it's this vision of Dionysius the Areopagite. God creates. And there is a freedom for us to respond. It is the great mystery of God's providence and our free will. We have the ability to choose. We know that. You're here and not home sleeping or watching television or skiing someplace. You're here. You made that free choice. And brilliant it is as a choice. Because we come to that fountain of light. We come to that source of salvation. And by doing so, you've shown the proper activity of your intellect and your will to know and to love. That's what Dionysius says. That's what St. Paul says. You can't act against the truth. The reality of the Divine Eucharist is the same. Even if you were home, sleeping on the sofa, or still sleeping in bed, or going shopping, or skiing, or whatever else you would have chosen freely to do otherwise, but the providence of God is the same. This is the Lord's day. This is the radiance of light. This is the source of divine grace that flows from the divine Eucharist. And so when St. Paul says we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth, everyone in the end glorifies God. Both the saints and the damned, they all glorify God. Now granted, the damned do not glorify God freely, they still glorify his justice. To put it in kind of colloquial terms, it's God's rule book. And in the end, God always wins. It just depends on whether you're on the winning team or not. That's the free choice. We can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. And so even the damned show forth God's truth in their condemnation and their selfishness. It's quite an extraordinary thing to think about. And during the Great Lent, when we contemplate what is virtue, what is conversion, what is it that we're actually supposed to be doing with these lives that we have been given, these are profound questions. And again, if you remember the last three weeks in our prayers, we say that you teach us what is the existence, the purpose of the world, what is the meaning of existence. This is what we're looking at. But what actually what we're asking for is to show us the radiance of your divine truth that is here before me. And our whole purpose in life is to find out what is it that God expects of me personally, individually. You know, in the kind of sentimentalistic vision of Christianity that portrays itself in the modern world, we kind of have this frivolous idea that you just kind of try to be a good person and then you wing away to heaven when you're dead. Well, and it's nice. It doesn't really say anything. A pagan could say exactly the same thing. Try to be a nice person. And when you're done, you'll go to the Elysian fields, whatever. But that vision is not the vision of our Lord. Our Lord says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. That's pretty direct, and pretty clear. He didn't say, well, try to do the best you can and it'll all be good. Now, if you love me, you will do what I tell you. And why? That sounds pretty restrictive to American ears. Who wants to be told you have to do this? But you'll notice the prodigal son, I have disobeyed. St. Paul talking about not being cast off, but being faithful to the truth. This aspect is why does our Lord command things? Not because he has some kind of Napoleon complex or some kind of psychological egoism. He does this because what he gives us in his teachings and his commandments is our freedom to find the correspondence with the truth. And when we correspond to this action of God's creation and the redemption of the return to him, that is our freedom. This is what our Lord means when he says that you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
I mean, this quotation has come up so many times in the last years, totally out of context, as being some kind of political statement. It's not a political statement. It is an existential statement. You will find the reality of who you are and who you are meant to be when you discern the light of Christ within your life and become the individual person that God has always intended you to be from all creation. That's a long ways from, well, just try to be nice and it'll be good. That doesn't mean anything. Because what even defines being nice? You know it. You read it, you see it, it's just pablo, it's mush, mental mush. It has no meaning behind it. But the radiance of life as portrayed by Dionysius the Areopagite and St. Paul teaching us, you can't do anything against truth either. So prove yourself, see that Christ is meant to be working within you, unless you're a reprobate, unless you're cast off. And so this is what Lent is about. What is my life supposed to be? And when we look over our past years, we realize, obviously, profoundly, that there are many aspects of my life which were pretty screwed up. And thanks be to God, I didn't dry, die in those screwed up periods. It's not a way to finish the Valley of Tears. But be that as it may, we live today. And the question becomes is what should my life look like today? And what should my life look like in the future? I'm not talking about job opportunities. We're talking about what we are meant to be existentially and the meaning and the purpose of our life and our existence. So that the day that we die, we can be content and at least have the hope that we have become the people that God intended us to become, not just something we floundered around and bobbed along with over decades and accomplished but truly what God desires us to be. So then you can use this all week, use this one phrase. We can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. Now I wanna leave you with the prayer for this morning's morning office, the sedro. So it's during the incense ceremony of the morning office. O Christ, look upon mankind for it cannot become anything other than what you make it. Which is very clear. Mankind cannot become anything other than what you make it. And then we ask for the grace. Remember in the Husoyo ceremony, in the, in the incense ceremony, that long prayer is called sedro. And sedro in the Aramaic means ranking, because we're asking for specific graces in God's mercy. So the first thing we ask for is remove from our hearts all selfishness, pride, enmity, and hate, that we may be freed from ignorance. These things cloud the mind and blind people. So that we may be freed from ignorance and error by your cross, which is the beacon at the center of your church. Always the cross, the luminous cross, seen as the lighthouse. And then it goes on and towards the end of the sedro it says, and make those return who have wandered and who have lost their way. That is the vision of the path of truth. To pray for those who are far, that they may return to the Father's house in the image of the prodigal son. And so when we make these prayers and these graces that we ask for, we truly want the illumination of our spirits and our lives to be in accord with the spirit that God has given us and in accord with the truth which is the foundation of creation. And when we do these things, St. Paul says in his letter to the Galatians, when you do these things, then you will not yield up to the lusts and the concupiscences of the flesh. In other words, you will not live just by nature. You will not live a life that just bobs along, trying to be nice. But you will have an intensity and clarity of what it is to practice virtue and to pursue goodness, because our desire is to enter into that infinite love that is God himself. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
you accepted the offerings of our ancestors, now receive these offerings that your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Christ and his plan of salvation for us. We recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Gregory the Great. Be mindful, O God, of the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
Deliver us from every evil and blot out all our transgressions that we may raise glory and thanks to you, the only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. For the love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Sinners, do not condemn us because of our sins. 
but have compassion and mercy upon us. Turn your holy face away from our sins and assist us. For this your church employs you and through you and with you, implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, O mighty Father, have mercy on us.
the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever.
thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink, O lover of all people. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassionate and merciful one, O lover of all people. Have mercy on us.
We thank you, O oh Father, for this gift that you have given us, though we are unworthy. Do not shame us because of our sins, but help and save us, so that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, stretch forth your right hand and bless your people. Protect them by your holy cross to be their shelter and refuge, and perfect them with your abundant blessings, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your blessed Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishments and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.